Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie? Welcome back to Remember That Movie. I am the third Alejandro Rosa on IMDb. And I'm Steve Johnston, still not on IMDb. Welcome to part two of Legend. Now, this is something we haven't done before, so we'll see how it goes. We decided at the end of part one that we needed to go back and actually watch a different version of this film. We saw the original, the 1986 Legend that a lot of people are familiar with, but we decided to watch Ridley Scott's director's cut of Legend. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Steve, welcome back. Pleasure to be here. It's been a while. As evidenced by the three prior cuts that no one will know about. Oh, rats. We've been recording for four minutes, and this is the first time we've gotten through the introduction. So, gonna go great. So, we're gonna do a couple of sections about this. This is gonna be different than our regular episodes. We have to kind of format it differently because we've already been here before. We went deep into the world of legend and into the making of legend, but now we have to revisit a different version of it. And, and by the way, I'll just go ahead. Spoiler alert. This isn't the only other version of this. This is like the multiverse of films. There is the director's cut. There is the original American cut. There is the international European cut, which was the one that was done in 1985. Mm -hmm. There is a TV version for the United States, which is slightly different there is a European TV version, which is slightly different as well. So there's at least four. We're going to talk about the director's cut. If this were anyone other than Ridley Scott, I might find all of that strange. But for some reason, you say his name and I immediately think, oh, there's got to be multiple versions of this. And multiple, multiple versions. Uh, first and foremost, when did this come out? So the DVD of the director's cut was released in 2002. And the Blu-ray was released in 2011. You and I actually bought a DVD. That's right. In 2023, I went online, purchased a DVD that was mailed to me. I watched it. I put it in, in a uh, priority envelope and I mailed it to Steve. And then he watched it. And now here we are. I want to make a disclaimer before we get into the depth of this, which is that in doing my research for this film. I also ended up accidentally doing research on the European original version. There is a good chance I'm going to mix these two up because they're similar. Yes. They actually have some differences, but they have a lot of similarities. The original cut of this film is the European cut. Then yes, they did sir. the American, and then many years later he did his version, the director's cut. I, I hate to nitpick this early on in the episode, but your timeline's slightly off. Explain. In our original episode, you mentioned that the initial cut of the movie was 125 minutes long. And that was determined to be far too long, and so they trimmed it. And they trimmed it down to 113 minutes. That version was screened for test audiences. And it was determined that, and I'm going to uh, quote the January 1986 edition of Cine Fantastique magazine, the 113-minute cut was considered Perfect. Perfect, that is, for an audience who didn't mind working at being entertained." Unquote. It is this version, this 113-minute version, that got trimmed down, lost, and eventually in, I think it was the late 1990s, a print was rediscovered, and that is what became the director's cut. So technically, this actually precedes both the European and the American versions. Huh. All right. I'm going to go with it. Okay. Good. <laughs> I have a question for you, Steve. Usually in episodes, folks, one of us does the research and one of us is the audience member, essentially. Gets to just experience the film, write down commentary on it. But in this case, we have both now watched the film and we both agreed that for this second episode, we would do research. And we just went off into our little corners with our little laptops and, and did our own research. We did not discuss where we got the research from or what we were reading. And knowing Steve and I, we were looking at different things. 99% yes. sure of that. Yes. One question that I had was, do we know why he did this director's cut? Why he released this in 2002? 
from the little bit that I remember, it came about largely because of fans and the cult following that the movie originally had. If I understood the run of things correctly, there were a bunch of fans who were communicating on a message board, and that is how they unearthed this older cut, this older longer cut of the film. Now, how it came to then be released on DVD for public consumption, I am not 100% certain. However, Ridley Scott considered this to be like the true version of the film. This was the best version that there was. One thing that you do get with the director's cut, which I only got to watch a couple of snippets of, but I didn't have time to sit down and watch the whole thing, is that the director's cut has commentary from Ridley Scott. There might be some enlightening things there that we were just not thorough enough to research by watching the movie not once, not twice, but three times. All right, so we're going to do this in a couple of sections. We're going to start this with a section called What We Forgot. One of the things that's difficult when we're doing these episodes is that we like to highlight different performers. But sometimes if there's a lot of people involved, we don't get to everyone. So I thought it would be neat if we mentioned a couple of the secondary actors who we did not discuss, uh, I think, almost at all in the first episode. There, so there's a group of them. We have Screwball, played by Billy Bartley. Billy Bartley was a famous actor, and he was also a famous activist. He founded the Little People of America, which is a nonprofit that supports and provides resources for individuals with dwarfism and for their families. I believe this organization is still in existence. I figured out that I remember him from Willow. Ah, okay. Yes. Because I saw his face and I'm like, I know this actor. And I'm sure I've seen him in a lot. He did a lot of work. If you look at his resume, it's quite incredible. We had Peter O'Farrell, who was Pox. And we had Carl Cork Hubbard. He played Brown Tom, who I very much enjoyed in this film. Oh my gosh, he was so funny. He played Luther on a TV show called The Charmings. Steve. Do you know what The Charmings is? The Charmings? If you no. don't, it's okay. Because okay. it only ran for two seasons between 1987 and 1988. And I, no, I do not. Imagine a 1980s sitcom with okay. the classic, like, happy music and the kids are running in and the, the dad is like, oh, gosh, darn it. And you always yeah. have that silly neighbor, Ed. Imagine yeah. all of that and just add one little ingredient. They're all fairy tale characters. So it's essentially Prince Charming oh. and I think it's Snow White. Oh, the Charming. They fall asleep and they wake up like a thousand years later or two thousand years later. And it's modern day 80s. And they're all living in like regular time. And of course, of course, they're just trying to fit in. It did not last, but I watched it. Blunder was played by Kieran Shaw. I don't know if you're familiar with Kieran Shaw, but he has been in so many of the Star Wars films playing different oh. characters. He was in Lord of the Rings. He was in The Hobbit. He was in the Harry Potter series a couple of times. So those are some of our actors that we didn't mention. We mentioned how incredible the uh, special effects and the, the makeup were in this film. Peter Rob King and Rob Botton. These gentlemen were nominated for an Academy Award for their work in Legend. The more research I've done on this, the more amazing I think the work that they did was. I even heard Tim Curry being interviewed talking about the makeup. We said that he had a body thing, like a, his chest was covered and that his face was covered and he had horns. What I didn't take into account was that his arms, he has a layer of fake muscles all over his entire body. Oh, wow. His hooves were stilts. He was about eight feet tall in full costume from like <laughs> hoof to horn. He was eight feet. That's awesome. Um, yes. So he said it was incredible. He said, when I, when I finally had everything on, I looked like a superhero. I had a superhero body because he was very thin. Rob Botton went on to create a very famous costume, and that is RoboCop. Ah. He did a lot of the wild makeup effects for Total Recall. Oh, okay. I, I would actually like to, perhaps this is a mini segment called Eating Crow. I owe an apology to the set designer of this film, Mr. Ashton Gorton. He was an Academy Award-nominated uh, set designer, not for this, for something else. When we watched this film, I said that one of my criticisms was, it feels like a set. I'm watching a movie, I can tell it's a set. Yes. When I watched more in-depth stuff about the actual set design, what it looked like behind the scenes, how massive it actually was, 
I gained an incredible amount of respect for this set design. And I love set design just in general. It was striking. And in fact, there is a shot that isn't in the film because they kept postponing it. They wanted to do this kind of crane shot through the forest. And there is a test shot of the crane shot. And it's amazing. It's an entire forest inside a studio. And Ridley Scott said, okay, okay we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. And finally, the time came. They did that shot because that was the practice run. Then they took lunch. And then the set caught on fire. And they never got to do the giant crane shot that they were supposed to do that they had planned oh. on. So my heart broke for <laughs> Mr. Corton when he watched his entire set go up in flames. So... Uh, so I apologize. I apologize. It is a beautiful set. It's an incredible set. And, uh, and I have full respect for them. Uh, last but not least, I wanted to mention Alex Thompson, the cinematographer for this film that we didn't mention at all in, in the last, uh, <laughs> which is too bad because he was nominated for an Academy Award for Excalibur. Oh. You know what he did not long after this, a movie we've mentioned in the prior episode? He was the cinematographer for Labyrinth. So where should we go from here, Steve? We've done the what we forgot, I think. I've given my disclaimer of the things I'm going to get wrong. Did we have anything before we get to the changes, you think? I don't think so. Not, uh, nothing comes to mind off the top of my head. I think we can start getting into the scenes that uh, we particularly took note of. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, we c we're not going to do a shot by shot about the differences between these two films. It would take too long and it would be way too boring. For some. For some, they would love it. Uh, how do I know? Because I was one of the people who actually watched some of the videos that were shot by shot and what the differences were. But we are going to just mention some of the ones that really stood out to us as far as the changes between these two films because there are a few quite different changes. And then we'll get to the conclusions. Let's go into it. I think a very good place to start would be at the very beginning. What was... Uh, the very first thing that we saw in the theatrical version that mercifully was missing from the director's version. Do you remember? The storybook text scroll. Yes. Yes. You remember I asked about that and I asked if it worked for you and I said, well, it was okay, but I'm not usually a huge fan of exposition dumps via reading. And in this version, that's not there. We start with Blix arriving at the Hall of the Lord of Darkness, and Tim Curry does an excellent job explaining the current status of things, what's going on, what he intends to do. And then he's telling Blix his plan, says, right, go and kill the unicorns. There is only one bait that will lure them out. And Blix says, what is it, my lord? And he says, innocence. Quick cut to Princess Lily traipsing through the forest, and in my mind I went, Yes! That is how you do a character introduction like that. Don't tell me in text form, Princess Lily is pure of heart. No. Half the bad guy say, We need someone innocent, and then, oh, here she is, traipsing through the forest. I believe that this version, the Lord of Darkness's speech is longer to give us that information that the text scroll would have given us. Yes. There's another thing that I really loved about what is missing from this moment, which is the Lord of Darkness is not seen. No, that's right. In the original American version, we have the Lord of Darkness, and we talked about that the Lord of Darkness is sitting in his throne, and we see the neon eyes and neon nails. And something yes. that I hadn't realized, because I think I just assumed it was coloring, mm -hmm. is that the Lord of Darkness is actually colored black in that scene. And he's red, typically. Mm -hmm. But in that scene, he's black. That was made later. That okay. is not in the original uh, no. European version. And it is not in the director's cut. And one thing that I did read about that was that Ridley Scott wanted him to not be seen until Lily sees him. Right. We, the audience, never see him. We see his hand, but nothing else. He loved the suspense of that. It's actually an hour into the film before you see the Lord of Darkness. We took it for granted because we'd already seen him in the first movie. But in this one, you don't see him until much, much later, which makes the scene in which he comes out of the mirror an hour later make more so, sense why yeah. it's so dramatic. Yes. There was something that stood out with me right away at the beginning of this film, and that was 
Lily is singing. Yes. Lily doesn't sing in the original American version at no. all. Why is she singing? And then, as my notes will tell you, she doesn't sing one time. She sings four times. Lily sings. I had no idea. That was fascinating. In fact, one of her songs, like, I think it's the third one, maybe it's the fourth one, yeah. in the lyrics is the answer to Gump's riddle that Jack ends up being able to answer because Lily sings it in a song. Oh, I missed that. That's, that's excellent. And by the way, to give credit where credit is due, those songs were written by John Bettis, who apparently famously worked with the Carpenters at some point. There's a couple of things at the very beginning of the film that are different and, and change some of the, the tone for the film. Uh, first and foremost, the singing is very different and affects the unicorn scene in a huge way, yes. which we'll get to. Yeah, uh, It just com completely changes the dynamic. But it's also, like you said, it's such a great way to introduce a character who's just walking through the woods singing. We don't know who she is. Right. I greatly appreciated that uh, compared to knowing that, oh, this is the princess. It's like, no, if, you know, ignoring what we knew from our original and you know, acting like we had seen the director's cut and this was the first time we were watching the movie, you don't know who this girl is. All you know is that, oh, bad guy thinks she's innocent and here she is traipsing through the woods. I liked that not knowing and then finding out later after she's been mischievous and torments the washerwoman that, oh yeah, she's actually royalty. Yeah, it was great. Also, did you notice that her husband was in the cabin? Yes. Was he always there? Did we ever see him in there? I don't think we did because I don't recall seeing him alive for the first time around. He's a deep sleeper because Lily's just running around his house and they have a whole conversation and he's just in a corner asleep. There was the animal communication scene. Okay, let me rephrase that. Okay. There's an animal communication scene <laughs> that is not in the American version. And I was like, what are they talking? Oh, this is a whole scene where it, it is clear that Jack and Lily hang out all the time, and Jack has been teaching Lily how to make different animal sounds. Clearly, he can communicate with everything. So he's been teaching her, and she's apparently a good student, as she says. And even mentions her father. Mm -hmm. She says, my father says I'm an excellent student. That was kind of fascinating and different. And there is a massive change in this scene, which is all about sex. Or the lack thereof. Perfect. That's right. So I remember this, and I don't remember if this was cut out of the first episode. There is a moment at the beginning of the uh, American version in which Jack and Lily are running through the forest, and then all of a sudden she's in the grass, and then they kiss, and then they cut to the sun, as they do in movies where they don't want you to see anything, but they're insinuating, wow, Jack, wow, wow. You know, I want you to know that I came up with three different ways to say that, and I wasn't sure how I was going to get it to you. And that's the one you went with. <laughs> that... <laughs> I didn't say it was the right choice. I just said it was the choice it was I a made. Choice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did a little digging, watched this version. That scene with her in the grass is in this movie at the end. Very end, yep. At the end of the film, he kisses her. She wakes up. Jack, I had the most terrible dream. And then he helps her up. Oh. What they did was they reversed it so it looks like he's laying her down on the grass. And they did that for the American version. Yep. Because, and this is actually true, they decided they needed more violence, more insinuation of sex, because they wanted to sell it to the American audience. And they thought, this is what the kids want. They want violence and sex. So let's pretend that we were making this very sexual. <laughs> In the original episode, we mentioned that there was a sex scene that had been written that included the Lord of Darkness and Lily. Yes. Which makes no sense whatsoever and is totally messed up. Uh, I'm going to give credit to a, uh, another YouTuber. Movie Oubliette does a great breakdown of the differences between the American and European versions of this film. Please check it out. It's fantastic. They do an incredible job. Stephen. They found what this sex scene was about. Apparently, in the sex scene, they spent most of the time, quote, licking each other. <laughs> now we're going to segue to something else. 
Folks, I just want you to know that I've been looking forward to saying that to Steve all day. Part of me is very upset with you that you're just going to put that image in my mind and then go, let's talk about something else. No, it's so great. So anyway, more about Lily singing. So <laughs> there's a scene when the unicorns and Lily meet. The unicorn actually gets angry at her for coming near the other unicorn and comes like storming at her and then starts like running around her mm -hmm. and scaring her. First of all, she bends down like, you know, so sorry. And then she starts singing. And it soothes the unicorn. And it is so beautiful. Yes. Such a beautiful scene. It just had a different feel to it. Did you, did you find that? I wholeheartedly agree with you. This was a much better take on meeting the unicorn. Whereas in the theatrical version, if I'm remembering correctly, it was more of a, she goes up, she kneels down, the unicorn approaches, she strokes the nose and that's it. This is more of a... I'm going to approach, and as you say, the unicorn takes offense at this, charges at her, which admittedly was quite scary. Yeah. And then she sings her song and calms it down and then allows her to actually make contact. And I thought that was far better. One of the things we focus on is on Lily's innocence. Mm. But it feels like in this film, like Jack is in the same boat of innocence. Like he is very much the reluctant hero. Yes. He's afraid of her hurting him. They don't actually share a kiss until the very end. I don't know. There's something about him a little bit more uncertain. Yes. Um, my favorite thing that they changed is the uh, Meg Mucklebones scene. Yep, I had that one on as well. Go ahead, because I found this one fascinating. What a, what a change. So in the theatrical version that we originally watched, Meg Mucklebones appears, she makes a couple quick comments, and then Jack lops her head off. In this version, the scene is significantly longer. Meg Mucklebones comes out, is very threatening, and Jack spends a lot of time hiding behind his shield and then sort of showing Meg her reflection in the shield, trying to distract her. And once he has distracted her with her own reflection, he tries to draw his sword and immediately drops it because it is far heavier than he imagined. So he then kind of rolls over, grabs it with both hands, and then manages to lop Meg's head off. This does an excellent job, I feel, of showing some character growth on his part, because in the theatrical release, he's just kind of, oh, the hero. Here, he's far more reluctant about it. When he first meets with Gump, and Gump says, oh, we are going to need a champion, it's gonna be you. And he's like, ah, no. During the director's cut, we see him grow into that role where he starts off green, essentially, unsure of himself, doesn't know quite what he's doing, drops the sword, has to two-hand it, but he grows over the course of the movie into the role of the champion, which um, I thought was far better than just the, oh, no, he's the hero, he's always been the hero. There's a great line at the end of, the, uh, of Meg Mucklebones when he does actually cut off her head He's more surprised than anyone. Yes, that's right. He actually says, I did it. I found that so charming. I was like, oh, now this is a character I can get behind. Yes. Last but not least is the end. Before we get to the end, there are a couple more scenes that I would like to go into, if we may. Uh, the first one I wanted to discuss was one that I actually felt drug on a little too long in this version, and that's meeting Gump for the first time. In the theatrical version, Gump appears, says, Jack, something's wrong. Do you know what happened? Jack says, well, yeah, Lily kind of touched the unicorn. Gump goes, what? Jack goes, but I did it for love. And Gump goes, well, that's all right then. Pour the wine. Here, there is, a, there is an added part to that, which is uh, once he finds out that Jack did everything that he had done for love, he goes, okay, I'm going to ask you a riddle. And if you answer it correctly, you get to live. If you don't, you don't. Something just to add to that is that Jack pretends that he doesn't know oh, in right. this version. Yes. In yeah. the other version, he immediately says, oh, I, I took her to the unicorns. And he's like, what? In this version, he's like, he's like, have you seen anything untoward? I think he even says. And Jack's like, nope. <laughs> don't think <laughs> Haven't so. Haven't seen a thing. And he's like, are you sure, Jack? He goes, yeah. I guess I do did take her to see the unicorns, right? I thought that was actually kind of interesting. I enjoyed that bit. I enjoyed it. I just felt that essentially it was the fiddle playing that kind of drug on a little bit. 
He could have asked the riddle, that was fine, but the fact that he pulls out a violin, starts playing, and that's how he asks the riddle. And then when Jack answers correctly, he goes Keith Moon on it and smashes it on the ground. That bit didn't work for me as well. It definitely plays into the very, very storytell version of the movie. Yes. The other scene that I had, um, I am just going to call Lily's Eyebrow. There is a point earlier in the film where Mia Sarah raises her left eyebrow slightly, and based on what's going on, we know that she's kind of plotting something mischievous, or she's concocting a plan of some description. Much later, when she is being seduced by the Lord of Darkness, and we have the marvelous scene at the dinner table where he commands her to sit, she says, no, I think I'll stand, and he rages. There is, in the director's cut version, part where she actually turns her back to the Lord of Darkness and faces the chair that she is supposed to sit in. And we get close-ups of her eyes that look that way, and there's like then a shot of some piece of scenery, and then she looks the other way, and there's a shot of another piece of scenery. And then she raises her left eyebrow ever so slightly, and then she turns around, starts to sit down, Lord of Darkness gets very excited, and then she goes, no, I think I'll stand still. Lord of Darkness rages, throws things off the table, and she laughs as she spins out of the chair, crouches down beside it, and that leads into the scene where she says, grant your bride a wish on this night. That added part where she faces the chair, and you actually see that, ah, she's concocting a plan. She has come up with something. We don't know what it is, but we know it's there. And so later on, when she betrays the Lord of Darkness and frees the unicorn, we, the audience, are not all that surprised. And I loved that addition. I think there is more of Lily, the smart, sharp person in this version. Yes. She is not just the damsel in distress. We really see more of how smart she is. And I really, I did like it. Also, what the hell was going on with that chair? When it starts pulsating as she's about to sit down on it. Yes. <laughs> That freaked me out. Like, that and the weird Ew. eyes. The, oh, the, yeah. the person yeah. with the eyes. I'm like, it's a Guillermo del Toro film. What's going on with that guy with the <laughs> glitter? Why does he have glitter? Never mind that the Lord of Darkness speaks to what we assume is his father who speaks back. Did you notice the change in this version? Explain. When Lord of Darkness calls out to his father and the father responds... In the U.S. theatrical version, it's the old man voice. You must bring her over to us. In this version, I swear it's Alice Platon doing another voice. <laughs> it's, it's, it's higher pitch. It is kind of Gump's voice that responds, which is weird because a scene later, there is an echo of the father's voice and it's the old man. And then Weird. there is a third scene where the father's voice echoes and it's back to Alice Platon's voice again. Now, <laughs> I, I could not confirm that this was actually the case, but there is, there is a very noticeable difference in that voice from one scene to the next to the next. I just want to say that regardless of the version, that whole thing's just creepy as I'll get out. <laughs> and I couldn't remember if the chair was pulsing in the first movie version no. or not. It wasn't because that just freaked me out. I'm like, don't sit there. Lily, do not sit. That chair's going to eat you. In the theatrical version, she never faces the chair. She never comes anywhere near it. She stands to the side of it and just says, no, I think I prefer to stand. Thank you. The end is interesting. In the American theatrical version, Jack wakes Lily up. They kiss and then they run off into the sunset only to turn around briefly to wave at their fairy friends. If you recall, I believe my quote from the last episode was, where are they going? Yes. This one does not end that way. This one ends totally different. I wouldn't say totally, but go on. In the sense that they don't end up together. Lily acknowledges that they are from different worlds. Jack is a forest creature and she's a princess and she gives him the ring and says to him, you belong here, but promises to come visit him. And he's like, cool. And then at the end, and this is the only version, by the way, that they do this in. I'm not counting the TV versions because I just don't know. I believe this is the only version in that we do get the sunset scene, but it's just Jack. Yes. Just waving at his fairy friends. I would still like to add, Jack, where the hell are you going? Don't you live here? You had told me this was the ending of this version in the previous episode. So I went in knowing that is what's supposed to be happening. 
However, as I was watching it the other night, I couldn't help but think that, oh yes, Lily says, you belong here, I'm going back to the castle, here is the ring, I will come back and visit often. I could have, I would have sworn up and down that the intent was that Jack then says, no, I'm in love with her, I'm chasing after her, and that's why he runs over the hill into the sunset, that he's chasing Lily to be with her. The only thing I think that prevents that from being correct is that I don't remember where Lily runs off to. Ran off some other way. That that's that's the problem. I th I think she ran off into the woods, and then Jack runs off into the sunset. It's like ah, okay. I think it's actually open. It's not conclusive what happens next, and I think that is intentional. We don't know what happens next. Do they end up together? Does Jack run off and learn how to wear pants? Like we don't know. And I like that. I like that so much more. Okay, we have to talk about the music. We do indeed. If you recall. If you listen to our first episode, this movie had a soundtrack composed by Jerry Goldsmith. By the way, we did not do him justice. No, we really didn't. But I think the reason we did not do him justice is that ultimately it was not his soundtrack that was in the version of the movie we were talking about. Let me just say who Jerry Goldsmith is. Jerry Goldsmith was a famous movie composer. By the end of his career, he had 18 Academy Award nominations. When he did this movie, he had already won his one and only Oscar for creating the music for The Omen in 1976. Listeners, you know Jerry Goldsmith's work. And you'll say, no, I don't. And I'll say, yes, I'm going to name a couple of films. And this is not even all of them. This is just the ones I picked. Alien. Planet of the Apes. Five of the Star Treks, Three Rambos, Total Recall, L.A. Confidential, Gremlins, Supergirl, The Secret of Nim, and IQ, which we recently did. And so, Academy Award winner is asked to compose the music for this, and then it's taken away. We talked about this. Tangerine Dream and our other two fellas. By the way, oh, I wanted to share this with you, Steve. Remember how we said it was Tangerine Dream and it was the two other artists who were brought in? Yes. Tangerine Dream, they did this to them too. Those two other artists, that was the studio. They messed with them. Tangerine Dream was like, what is this music? Oh, and they're like, oh, we decided to add this to the point, and this is great. And again, I'm going to give this back to uh, Movie uh, Oblique. The song at the end of the film with the guy who was from uh, Roxy. Brian Ferry. Folks, they did that for the kids. They wanted to have a hit song to go with the movie, and there is a incredibly 1980s video of him singing that song to Legend in the background, and it's terrible. No disrespect to Tangerine Dream. They were hired to do a job, and they did it. What is funny about all that is this film tested badly in front of an audience, and apparently, and this is actually typical in Hollywood, one of the things that we'll often do is let's rework the score, because that's cheaper than redoing the film. <laughs> right. Let's change the music. Maybe change the music, change change everything, right? And I think you can agree that these two soundtracks tell a completely different story. Yes. And how did that end up? With less than $16 million at the U.S. box office. In this film, Ridley Scott puts in the original music. This was also the music that was in the European version and has stated that he regretted taking the music out to begin with. What did you think about this change? Or this return to the original? I am glad that they restored Goldsmith's work because it gives you a chance to experience what it was and what the movie was supposed to be. When it comes to my own opinion, though, I have kind of a hypothesis that the version that you prefer is going to be very heavily influenced by which version you saw first. We watched Tangerine Dream version first, and then we watched Jerry Goldsmith's we heard Jerry Goldsmith's work. I will say that Jerry Goldsmith's work is beautiful. I don't remember any of it. I feel bad because I know it's Jerry Goldsmith, but I couldn't hum for you a single melody from his version of the soundtrack. I can remember a couple of the Tangerine Dream versions. I was wrestling with myself trying to figure out, okay, which is better? Is it this one or that one? Um, I believe one of the comments in the previous video mentioned that the writer preferred Tangerine Dream's version and could not understand why you'd get Jerry Goldsmith to replace it. I have come to the conclusion, and this was probably going to be an unpopular opinion, 
that neither one is the ideal soundtrack. I think that the ideal soundtrack for this movie is going to be a blend of the two. Any time that you are in the forest, that you're in some natural setting, or it's just our heroes out and about, Goldsmith. The moment you set foot inside the Lord of Darkness's fortress, or any time where it's focused heavily on the goblins, Tangerine Dream. So that you have sort of an audio... Uh, the, the audio adds to the sense of which side, good versus evil, you're watching. Right. The The one scene that I was looking forward to watching because this is the one that I really used to judge one soundtrack versus the other and that is the waltz of the dress when this magical dress appears and tries to seduce Lily into wearing it Tangerine Dream's version of that waltz is better than Goldsmith's and again apology to Jerry's Goldsmith the other version is just it's just better I shall now duck for the tomatoes that are going to be thrown at me. No, 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 no. Something that I thought about, and, you know, I may have dissed Tangerine Dream a bit in the last episode, is something that I saw in articles and videos about Goldsmith versus Tangerines. A lot of people, like, like myself, who grew up watching this film, if you have a sentimental attachment to this film, I have a couple of friends who were interested in this episode, the first one, because they have memories of watching Legend. If you're attached to to the sound of that version because of your, you know, memories and the sentimental stuff, then you're not going to like Jerry Goldsmith's version because it's a different movie. Right. Everyone gets to have, I think, their choice in this. I don't think either is better. I think everyone gets to choose what they like because I saw as many people who were like, oh, now I get it. Now this is a better <laughs> movie. And I had other people who were like, this sucks. Put Tangerine <laughs> Dream back in there. I'll give you my personal opinion as a, as a counterbalance to yours, mm -hmm. which is that I liked it. <laughs> I liked the music. I think it dates it a little less. Now, okay. Jerry Goldsmith loved using synthesizers. I wish he would have loved them a little less at the time, <laughs> because when he doesn't do that, I like it more. Mm -hmm. But that's maybe just my bias as to not loving synth music. I enjoyed it when the soundtrack is not connected to a time period then it feels more m mysterious, more fantasy, okay. right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, you can watch it in 20 years and it'll still sound the same and it'll still feel like it's a magical fairy tale. Whereas for me, I felt watching it with the US version of music, it felt very dated. This is definitely a 1980s soundtrack for a fantasy film. Again, that's my opinion. There is a quote from Jerry Goldsmith that I would like you to hear. I will hear it. This comes from an article in the Washington Post entitled The Saga of the Soundtracks, written by Richard Harrington. He interviewed Mr. Goldsmith, who said, I would have been more upset if they'd hired another composer and approached it in a symphonic style, but the fact that they went 180 degrees around with Tangerine Dream is sort of a joke to me. He adds, not laughing. Sorry, that just made me smile. So let's get to the meat of this. The big question, as it were. The big turkey leg of this conversation. Steve, you have watched the original US version. Mm -hmm. You have watched the director's cut. What is your thought? What is the better film? The director's cut, hands down. One of the major complaints we had about the theatrical cut was that everything just seemed rushed. There were snippets and bits and pieces happening that just didn't really make a whole lot of sense. You kind of got a sense of what was supposed to be happening, but no real confirmation. This version flows a lot better. Things, the scenes tie together better, and there is just a, a much better, I've used the word better a lot because it's, a, <laughs> it's the better of the two movies. In my opinion, we get better character development. We see Lily's, uh, as you say, being more intelligent and mischievous. Uh, we see Jack grow into the role of the champion rather than just be, oh, he is the champion. Done. If you remember, I complained that there was a lot of world building that we never got to see and therefore the world just seemed two-dimensional almost. Yes. That gets a bit more fleshed out. Not to the extent that I would have liked, but far better than the theatrical cut. I do think that the director's cut is, as Ridley Scott said, kind of the perfect cut of the movie. It is the, the better version, the true version that one should watch. 
yourself, sir, do you share that opinion, or are we going to agree to disagree? I will say, to start out, that I did not want to watch this movie again. Not that I didn't like it, but we, I felt like I had just watched it. Damn, why am I going to put myself through this just so that I can have different music? Then I watched it, and what I f surprised myself was that I was sort of enjoying it. Didn't mind the music. I could sense that things were different, though I couldn't always tell. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I spent a lot of time going, wait, was this like this the last time, or am I actually watching something different? I got to the end, and I was very surprised. And I was like, I kind of really like that, actually. And then, of course, we did all the research, and I got to actually see what, what was changed. In my personal opinion, I think this is a better film. Whatever your taste is in the music, I think the cut, the way it's edited, the things that were added back, the things that were taken away, I just think it flows so much better. It doesn't feel rushed. Is it perfect? No, but I really think this is a better movie. I think Tom Cruise and Ridley Scott are both right. And honestly, I actually enjoyed Tom Cruise a lot more in this one. Overall, the character of Jack is much more interesting in this version. Now, people who love the original are not going to like this film. They're not going to like that the scenes that they know are sometimes changed and that the music that you expect, the swell of tangerines, isn't there when you want it to be. People who love the waltz, you know, Lily's waltz. The music is different. It's just different. I did not mind it, but somebody else might because they're used to a certain thing. So yeah, I like this film. I think I'm actually a fan of this version. And if I was going to see it, if I was going to recommend someone see it for the first time, I would say watch the director. For real. That's a better experience for you. We have now spent four hours watching this film. <laughs> and what I can only assume is 17 hours recording these episodes. <laughs> you can catch this film by streaming, but I didn't quite find a place where you could stream the director's no. cut. You might actually have to buy it. Or maybe your local library has mm, it. There you go. Check. You never know. Maybe Inner Library Loan will get it for you. I don't it wasn't expensive, folks. DVD wasn't expensive. <laughs> um, I think that's it, Steve. I think we got to the end. I think we did. I think we're done with Legend. We can stop reading about this <laughs> damn movie. I feel like I have done nothing but read about Legend and bored my wife to tears <laughs> with every factoid. Thank you so much for listening to us jabber on a second time about Ridley Scott's Legend. Much appreciated. We will be back again with something else have no idea what it will be, but we'll come up with something. Have a good day, have a good afternoon, have a good night, and we will see you soon. Until next time. Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie?